grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Amen. From this morning's epistle reading, Romans 6, the last verse. So you also must consider yourselves dead to sin and alive to God in Christ Jesus. So far, God's word. I attended the Army's Chaplain Basic Officers course at Fort Monmouth, New Jersey. We assigned to us a special cadre of regular Army officers and drill instructors. What was their special skill, you may ask? Being able to ream us out, but without the perfunctory foul language normally employed by drill instructors. When it was time for us to go to field exercises, they bust us down to Fort Dix, compelled us to run the obstacle course. It was not an invitation. We were following orders. Now I'm going to be up front with you. I don't like heights. Now at one time I used to climb trees, ascend ladders with ease, work on house roofs. I even scaled Guadalupe Hidalgo in the Big Bend area of Texas. But I had a very scary fall at work and that caused me to become quite leery of heights. At Fort Dix, I was faced with both the tower and the cargo net. Now climbing the tower calls for teamwork and I had a great team that helped me through the ordeal. But the cargo net was something you had to accomplish all on your own. Getting to the top wasn't the hard part. It was going over the top and then climbing down. That was tough. And about a third of the way down I become hung up. And as I tried to get myself untangled I wound up with my foot caught in the net dangling upside down in the air. Chaplain, the ranger drill instructor shouted, quit playing around and get off my net. I'm stuck. Well, get yourself unstuck. The worst that can happen is that you die. Of course, that would seriously inconvenience me since I would be up all night completing the paperwork. So I struggled, I worked, I finally managed to pull my foot free, but now I hit the ground. And I hit the ground with a thud. And as I was laying there trying to catch my breath, he then comes over to me and says, are you hurt? I'm not sure. But did you die? Well, obviously, if I'm talking to you and not St. Peter, I must have survived. Well, then quit lollygagging on my obstacle course and move. That question, did you die, stuck with me. Yes, I'd been scared, especially as I'm hanging upside down, suspended about 12 or so feet in the air. There was a definite prospect of pain and injury if things went badly for me. And I did fall, and I landed flat on my back, and it knocked the wind out of me. Are you hurt? I'm not sure, but did you die? You know, facing dangerous and fearful situations can be scary. Your heart races, feels like it's going to beat itself out of your chest. Your mouth is parched, and you begin to perspire profusely. On the one hand, your mind races on everything that could go wrong, all the pain that could be possibly involved, but at the same time, you have to focus on what you need to do to get through it. And when you've made it through, you often feel a little bit more alive than you did before, right? See, to be alive and kicking often requires us to die to our fears. Now what if you knew that no matter what the outcome might be, you would be alive no matter what? Well, that is what our epistle reading from Paul's letter to the Romans addresses. So if you have your Bible with you, I invite you to turn to Romans chapter 6, beginning at verse 3 and read along with me. Do you not know that all of us who have been baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? We were buried, therefore, with him by baptism into death in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, we too might walk in newness of life. For if we have been united with him in a death like his, we shall certainly be united with him in a resurrection like his. We know that our old self was crucified with him in order that the body of sin might be brought to nothing so that we would no longer be enslaved to sin. 
For one who has died has been set free from sin. Now, if we have died with Christ, we believe that we will also live with him. We know that Christ, being raised from the dead, will never die again. Death no longer has dominion over him. For the death he died to sin, he died once for all. The life he lives, he lives to God. So you also must consider yourselves dead to sin and alive to God in Christ Jesus. Too many Christians have been taught and have come to believe that baptism is an act on their part to express their commitment to the faith. Thus, any time they feel like they have to recommit to their faith, then they also are rebaptized as a demonstration of that commitment. I had a friend of mine named Doug growing up back in my hometown. His dad was a Baptist deacon. Doug got himself in a lot of trouble. He always waited for the revivals to come in town. Maybe you've experienced that. About once a quarter, a revivalist would come into town, there'd be a whole week of services. I'll never forget that they, for his 16th birthday, they gave him a brand new car, which he straightened out a 35 mile an hour curve doing about 72 and ran right into the water tower of the town. They were not happy with Doug. Fortunately for him, Revivalist was in town the next week. And along with everybody else, he ran down and recommitted his life to Jesus and got rebaptized, and he had another car the next week. In such thinking, baptism is made to be an action on God's part rather than being an act of God. This belief, however, is not biblical. In Titus, we're told that God saved us through the washing of rebirth and renewal by the Holy Spirit whom he poured out on us generously through Jesus Christ our Savior, so that having been justified by his grace, we become heirs having the hope of eternal life. This is a trustworthy saying. We believe, teach, and confess that baptism is a sacrament, a means of grace, wherein God works for the sake of our life and our salvation. Concerning the effects of baptism, we hear the Bible tells us that whoever believes and is baptized will be saved, but whoever does not believe will be condemned. It's Jesus himself who says, Truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born of water and the Spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. Rather than a simple rite on man's part, Luther explains that baptism works forgiveness of sins, rescues from death and the devil, and gives eternal salvation to all who believe this as the words and promises of God declare. Through our baptism, we are given a new identity, a new status that is based upon our being born again as we were buried therefore with him by baptism into death in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, we too might walk in newness of life. Paul describes this to the Corinthians, telling them, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has passed away. Behold, the new has come. But did you die? The drill instructor would ask. The answer is, yes, I did. By our baptism into Christ, we have died. And now it's time to embrace our new life in him. So you must consider yourselves dead to sin and alive to God in Christ Jesus. Paul is teaching that baptism is meant to kill off our sinful nature's infatuation with sin and the devil. We know that our old self was crucified with him in order that the body of sin might be brought to nothing so that we would no longer be enslaved to sin. In his table talks, Luther is recorded answering this question. How do you begin your day? And he answers, I begin the day as I wash my face and make the sign of the cross to remember my baptism. Then I turn to the devil and tell him to go to hell and have a good day. Who says Luther wasn't colorful? The great reformer reflects the attitude that baptized believers can and should take. The devil, the world, our own sinful flesh will daily tempt us and try to lead us astray. Dangers will assail us. Fear will seek to compound us. But in baptism, we know this to be true. Now, if we have died with Christ, 
we believe that we will also live with him. But did you die? Paul tells us that for one who has died has been set free. Thus the answer is properly, yes, I died. We need to die to the fears and the failures in this world and live in the grace and the mercy of Christ's kingdom to come. And this we do through our baptism into Jesus Christ. As cable became increasingly expensive to keep, we cut the cord, so to speak. Now I no longer had access to the various news accounts that I had literally become addicted to. My channels were more geared toward entertainment. I began to notice that my le level of anxiety started to decrease, all because I changed my viewing habits. If you will, I died to sensational news media, became alive to a life without all the unwelcome news and unsolicited opinions. And I've also cut ties to any Facebook pages or other e-annoyances that try to hook me with their particular viewpoints and opinions. In short, I'm busily dying to the things of this world that detract from the hope and the joy I've found in Christ. That is what Paul is trying to get us to see. So you also must consider yourselves dead to sin, alive to God in Christ Jesus. I would invite you to consider your life and death in terms of what your baptism means for you. As Christ puts to death the sins of the world upon the cross, that means that he has already dealt with your sins. He has already justified you before God's judgment see it. And he seals for a sure and certain hope the confidence of your salvation and eternal life. Now if we have died with Christ, we believe we will also live with him. That is our hope. That is meant to be the outcome of our faith in Jesus. But did you die? Well, obviously not if I'm talking to you and not to St. Peter. Then quit lolly gagging around. And all God's people said, Amen. Now may the peace of God that passes all human understanding guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus, now and forever. Amen. Amen.